This is chapter one of the German ideology by Karl Marx. Thank you for listening. Karl Marx, the German ideology, preface. Hitherto, men have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions about themselves, about what they are and what they ought to be. They have arranged their relationships according to their ideas of God, of normal man, etc. The phantoms of their brains have got out of their hands. They, the creators, have bowed down before their creations. Let us liberate them from the chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings, under the yoke of which they are pinning away. Let us revolt against the rule of thoughts. Let us teach men, says one, to exchange these imaginations for thoughts which correspond to the essence of man, says the second, to take up a critical attitude to them, says the third, to knock them out of their heads, and existing reality will collapse. These innocent and childlike fancies are the kernel of the modern young Hegelian philosophy, which not only is received by the German public with horror and awe, but is announced by our philosophic heroes with the solemn consciousness of its cataclysmic dangerousness and criminal ruthlessness. The first volume of the present publication has the aim of uncloaking these sheep, who take themselves and are taken for wolves, of showing how their bleeding merely imitates, in a philosophic form, the conceptions of the German middle class, how the boasting of these philosophic commentators only mirrors the wretchedness of the real of the real conditions in Germany. It is its aim to debunk and discredit the philosophic struggle with the shadows of reality which appeals to the dreamy and muddled German nation. Once upon a time, a valiant fellow had the idea that men were drowned in water only because they were possessed with the idea of gravity. If they were to knock this notion out of their heads, say by stating it to be a superstition, a religious concept, they would be sublimely proof against any danger from water. His whole life long he fought against the illusion of gravity, of whose harmful results all statistics brought him new and manifold evidence. This valiant fellow was the type of this valiant fellow was the type of the new revolutionary philosophers in Germany. Part one Fuhrbach Opposition of the Materialist and Idealist Outlook A Idealism and Materialism the illusions of German ideology as we hear from German ideologists, Germany has in the last few years gone through an unparalleled revolution. The decomposition of the Hegelian philosophy, which began with Strauss, has developed into a universal ferment into which all the powers of the past are swept. In the general chaos, mighty empires have arisen only to meet with immediate doom. Heroes have emerged momentarily, only to be hurled back into obscurity by bolder and stronger rivals. It was a revolution beside which the French Revolution was child's play, a world struggle beside which the struggles of the Diado Diadochi, successors of Alexander the Great, appear insignificant. Principles ousted one another. Heroes of the mind overthrew each other with unheard of rapidity. And in three years eight and in the three years eighteen forty two to eighteen forty five, more of the past was swept away in Germany than at other times in three centuries. All this is supposed to have taken place in the realm of pure thought. Certainly it is an interesting event we are dealing with. The the petru the the petrusens of the absolute spirit. When the last spark of its life had failed, the various components of this caput mortem began to decompose, entered into new combinations, and formed new substances. The industrialists of philosophy, who till then had lived on the exploitation of the absolute spirit, now seized upon the new combinations.
each with all possible zeal, set about retailing his apportioned share. This naturally gave rise to competition, which, to start with, was carried on in moderately staid bourgeois fashion. Later, when the German market was glutted, and the commodity, in spite of all efforts, found no response in the world market, the business was spoiled in the usual German manner by fab fabricated and fictitious production, deterioration in quality, adulteration of the raw materials, falsification of labels, fictitious purchases, bill jobbing, and a credit system devoid of any real basis. The competition turned into a bitter struggle, which is now being extolled and interpreted to us as a revolution of world significance. The begetter of the most prodigious results and achievements. If we wish to rate at its true value this philosophic char charlatanry, which awakens even in the breasts of the honest German citizen a glow of national pride. If we wish to bring out clearly the pettiness, the parochial narrowness of this whole young Hegelian movement, and in particular the tr tragic comic contrast between the illusions of these heroes about their achievements and the actual achievements themselves, we must look at the whole spectacle from a standpoint beyond the frontiers of Germany. In the first version of the clean copy, there follows a passage which is crossed out. We preface, therefore, the specific criticism of individual representatives of this movement with a few general observations, elucidating the ideological premises common to all of them. These remarks will suffice to indicate the standpoint of our criticism insofar as it is required for the understanding and the motivation of the subsequent individual criticisms. We oppose these remarks to Feuerbach in particular because he is the only one who has at least made some progress and whose works can be examined de bon foi. 1. Ideology in general, and especially German philosophy. A. We know only a single science, the science of history. One can look at history from two sides and divide it into the history of nature and the history of men. The two sides are, however, inseparable. The history of nature and the history of men are dependent on each other so long as men exist. The history of nature, called natural science, does not concern us here, but we will have to examine the history of men since almost the whole ideology amounts either to the to a distortion to a distorted conception of this history or to a complete abstraction from it ideology is itself only one of the aspects of this history there follows a passage dealing with the premises of the materialist conception of history it is not crossed out and in this volume it is reproduced as section 2 Ideology in general, German ideology in particular, German criticism has, right up to its latest efforts, never quitted the realm of philosophy. Far from examining its general philosophic premises, the whole body of its inquiries has actually sprung from the soil of a definite philosophical system, that of Hegel. Not only in their answers, but in their very questions, there was a mystification this dependence on Hegel is the reason why not one of these modern critics has even attempted a comprehensive criticism of the Hegelian system. However much, however much each pro professes to have advanced beyond Hegel, their polemics against Hegel and against one another are confined to this. Each, act each extracts one side of the Hegelian system and turns this against the whole system as well as against the sides extracted by the others. To begin with, they extracted pure unfalsified Hegelian categories such as substance and self-consciousness. Later, they desecrated these categories with more secular names such as species, the unique man, etc. The entire body of German philosophical criticism, from Strauss to Stirner, is confined to criticism of religious con conceptions. The following passage is crossed out in the manuscript. 
claiming to be the absolute redeemer of the world from all evil. Religion was continually regarded and treated as the arch enemy, as the ultimate cause of all relations repugnant to these philosophers. The critics started from real religion and actual theology. What religious, con con what religious consciousness and a religious conception really meant was determined variously as they went along. Their, their advance consisted in subsuming the allegedly dominant metaphysical, political, jur juridical, moral, and other conceptions under the class of religious or theological conceptions. And similarly, in pronouncing political, juridical, moral consciousness as religious or theological, in the political, juridical, moral man, man in the last resort, as religious. The dominance of religion was taken for granted. Gradually, every dominant relationship was pronounced a religious relationship and transformed into a cult, a cult of law, a cult of the state, etc., on all sides, it was only a question of dogmas and belief in dogmas. The world was sanctified to an ever-increasing extent to at least our venerable St. Max was able to canonize it in block and thus dispose of it once for all. The old Hegelians had comprehended everything as soon as it was re reduced to an Hegelian logical category. The young Hegelians criticized everything by attributing to it religious conceptions or by pronouncing it a theological matter. The young Hegelians are in agreement with the old Hegelians in their belief in the role of religion, of concepts, of a universal principle in the existing world. Only the one party attacks this dominion as usurp usurpation, usurpation, only the one party attacks this dominion as usurpation, while the other extols it as legitimate. Since the young Hegelians consider conceptions, thoughts, ideas, in fact all the products of consciousness to which they attribute an independent existence as the real chains of men, just as the, whole, just as the old Hegelians declared them the true bonds of human society, it is evident that the young Hegelians have to fight only against these illusions of consciousness, since, according to their fantasy, the relationships of men, all their doings, their chains, and their limitations are products of their consciousness, the young Hegelians logically put to men the moral postulate of exchanging their present consciousness for human, critical, or ego egoistic consciousness, and thus of removing their limitations. This demand to change consciousness amounts to a demand to interpret reality in another way, i.e., to recognize it by means of another interpretation. The young Hegelian ideologists, in spite of their allegedly world-shattering statements, are the staunchest conservatives. The most recent of them have found the correct expression for their activity when they declare they are only fighting against phrases. They forget however, that to these phrases, they themselves are only opposing other phrases, and that they are in no way combating the real existing world when they are merely combating the phrases of this world. The only results which this philosophic criticism could achieve, could achieve were a few and at that thoroughly one-sided elucidations of Christianity from the point of view of religious history. All the rest of their assertions are only further embellishments of their claim to have furnished, in these unimportant elucidations, discoveries of universal importance. It has not occurred to any one of these philosophers to, in, to inquire into the connection of German philosophy with the German reality, the relation of their criticism to their own material surroundings. First premises of materialist method, the premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises from which abstraction can only be made in the imagination. They are the real individuals. Their activity, 
and the material conditions under which they live, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way. The first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of living human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Of course, we cannot here go either into the actual physical nature of man or into the natural conditions in which man finds himself, geological, hydrographical, climatic, and so on. The writing of history must always set out from these natural bases and their modification in the course of history through the action of men. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, except which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends first of all on the, na on the nature of the actual means of subsistence they find in, in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of, act of activity of these individuals a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of individuals thus depends on the material conditions determining their production. This production only makes its appearance with the increase of population in its turn, this presupposes the intercourse of individuals with one another. The form of this intercourse is again determined by production. 3. Production and intercourse. Division of labor in forms of property, tribal, ancient, feudal. The relations of different nations among themselves depend upon the extent to which each has developed its productive forces. The division of labor and internal intercourse. This statement is generally recognized, but not only the relation of one nation to others, but also the whole internal structure of the nation itself depends on the stage of development reached by its production and its internal and external intercourse. How far the productive forces of a nation are developed is shown most manifestly by the degree to which the division of labor has been carried. Each new productive force, insofar as it is not merely a quantitative extension of productive forces already known, for instance, the bringing into cultivation of fresh land, causes a further development of the division of labor. The division of labor inside a nation leads at first to the separation of industrial and commercial from agricultural labor, and hence to the separation of town and country into the conflict of their interests. Its further development leads to the separation of commercial from industrial labor. At the same time, through the division of labor inside these various branches, there develop various divisions among the individuals cooperating in definite kinds of labor. The relative position of these individual groups is determined by the methods employed in, in agriculture. Industry and commerce patriarchalism, slavery, estates, classes, these same conditions are to be seen, given a more developed intercourse in the relations of different nations to one another. The various stages of development in the division of labor are just so many different forms of ownership, i.e., the existing stage in the division of labor determines also the relations of individuals to one another with reference to the material, instrument, and product of labor. The first form of ownership is tribal ownership. It corresponds to the 
un undeveloped stage of production at which a people at which a people lives by hunting and fishing by the rearing of beasts or in the highest stage agriculture in the latter case it presupposes a great mass of un of uncultivated stretches of land the division of labor is at this stage still very elementary and is confined to a further extension of the natural division of labor existing in the family the social structure is is therefore limited to an extension of the family patriarchal family chieftains below them the members of the tribe finally slaves the slavery latent in the family only develops gradually with the increase of population the growth of wants and with the extension of external relations both of war and of barter the second form is the ancient communal and state and, and state ownership which proceeds especially from the union of several tribes into a city by agreement or by conquest and which is still accompanied by slavery beside communal ownership we already find movable and later also immovable private property developing but as an abnormal form subordinate to communal ownership the citizens hold power over their laboring slaves only in their community and on this account alone therefore they are bound to the form of communal ownership it is the communal private property which compels the active citizens to remain in this spontaneously derived form of association over against their slaves for this reason the whole structure of society based on this communal owner communal ownership and with it the power of the people decays in the same measure as in particular immovable private property evolves the division of labor is already more developed we already find the antagonism of town and country later the antagonism between those states which represent town interests and those which represent country interests and inside the towns themselves the antagonism between industry and maritime commerce the class relation between citizens and slaves is now completely developed with the development of private property we find here for this for the first time the same conditions which we shall find again only on a more extensive scale with modern private property on the one hand the concentration of private property which began very early in rome as the Wicinian agrarian law proves and pre proceeded very rapidly from the from the time of the civil wars and especially under the emperors on the other hand coupled with this the transformation of the plebeian small peasantry into a proletariat which however o owing to its intermediate position between property citizens and slaves never achieved an independent development the third form of ownership is feudal or estate property if antiquity started out from the town in its little territory the middle ages started out from the country this different starting point was determined by the sparseness of the population at that time which was scattered over a large area and which received no large increase from the conquerors in contrast to greece and rome feudal development at the outset therefore extends over a much wider territory prepared by the roman conquests and the spread of agriculture at first associated with it the last centuries of the declining roman empire and its conquest by the barbarians destroyed a number of productive forces agriculture had declined industry had decayed for want of a market trade had died out or been violently suspended the rural and urban population had decreased from these conditions and the and the mode of organization of the conquest determined by them feudal property developed under the influence of the germanic military constitution like tribal and communal ownership it is based again on a community but the directly producing class standing over against it is not as in the case of the ancient community the slaves but the inserved small peasantry
as soon as feudalism is fully developed, there also arises antagonism to the towns. The hierarchical structure of land ownership and the armed bodies of retainers associated with it gave the nobility power over the serfs. This feudal organization was, just as much as the ancient communal ownership, an association against a subjected producing class. But the form of association in the relation to the direct producers were different because of the different conditions of production. This feudal system of land ownership had its counterpart in the towns in the shape of corporative property, the feudal organization of trades. Here, property consisted chiefly in the labor of each individual person. The necessity for association against their organized robber nobility, the need for communal covered markets in an age when the industrialist was at the same time a merchant, the growing competition of the escaped serfs swarming into the rising towns, the feudal structure of the whole country, these combined to bring about the guilds. The gradually accumulated small capital of individual crafts craftsmen and their stable numbers, as against the growing population, evolved the relation of journeymen and apprentice, which brought into being in the towns a hierarchy, a hierarchy similar to that in the country. Thus, the chief form of property during the feudal epoch consisted on the one hand of landed property with serf labor chained to it, and on the other, of the labor of the individual with small capital commanding the labor of journeymen. The organization of both was determined by the restricted conditions of production, the small scale and primitive cultivation of the land, and the, cra and the craft type of industry. There was little division of labor in the heyday of feudalism. Each country bore in itself the antithesis of town and country. The division into estates was certainly strongly marked, but apart from the differentiation of princes, nobility, clergy, and peasants in the country, and masters, journeymen, apprentices, and soon also the rabble of casual laborers in the towns, no division of importance took place. In agriculture, it was rendered difficult by the strip system, beside which the cottage industry of the peasants themselves emerged. In industry, there was no division of labor at all in the individual trades themselves, and very little between them. The separation of industry and commerce was found already in existence in older towns. In the newer, it only developed later. When the towns entered into mutual relations, the grouping of larger territories into feudal kingdoms was a necessity for the landed nobility as for the towns. The organization of the ruling class, the nobility, had, there, had therefore everywhere a monarch at its head. 4. The essence of the materialist conception of history, social being and social consciousness. The fact is, therefore, that definite individuals who are productively active in a, in a definite way enter into these definite social and political relations. Empirical observation must in each separate instance bring out empirically and without any mystification and speculation the connection of the social and political structure with production. The social structure and the state are continually evolving out of the life process of definite individuals, but of individuals not as they may appear in their own or other people's imagination, but as they really are, i.e. as they operate, produce materially, and hence as they work under definite material limits, presuppositions and conditions independent of their will. The following passage is crossed out in the manuscript. The ideas which these individuals form are ideas either about their relation to nature or about their mutual relations or about their own nature. It is evident that in all these cases, their ideas are the conscious expression, real or illusory, of their real relations and activities, of their production, of their intercourse, 
of their social and political conduct. The opposite assumption is only possible if in addition to the spirit of the real, materially evolved individuals, a separate spirit is presupposed. If the conscious expression of the real relations of these individuals is illusory, if in their imagination they turn reality upside down, then this in its turn is the result of their limited material mode of activity and their limited social relations arising from it. The production of ideas, of, con of conceptions, of consciousness is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse, intercourse of men. The language of real life, conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men, appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behavior. The same applies to mental production as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, etc. of a people. Men are the producers of their conceptions, ideas, etc. Real, active men, as they are conditioned by a definite development of their productive forces and of the intercourse corresponding to these up to its furthest forms. Consciousness can never be anything else than conscious existence, and the existence of men is their actual life process. If in all ideology men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from their physical life process. In direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here we ascend from earth to heaven. That is to say, we do not set out from what men say, imagine, conceive, nor from men as narrated, thought of, imagined, conceived, in order to arrive at men in the flesh. We set out from real, active men, and on the basis of their real-life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. The phantoms formed in the human brain are also necessarily sub sublimates of their material life process, which is empirically verifiable and bound to material premises. Morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness thus no longer retain the semblance of independence. They have no history, no development, but men, developing their material production and their material intercourse, alter, along with their real existence, their thinking and the products of their thinking. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. In the first method of approach, the starting point is consciousness, taken as the living individual. In the second method, which conforms to real life, it is the real living individuals themselves, and consciousness is considered solely as their consciousness. This method of approach is not devoid of premises. It starts out from the real premises and does not abandon them for a moment. Its premises are men, not in any fantastic isolation and rigid rigidity, but in their actual empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. As soon as this active life process is described, history ceases to be a collection of dead facts as it is with the empiricists themselves still abstract, or an imagined activity of imagined subjects as with the idealists. Where speculation ends in real life, their real positive science begins. The representation of the practical activity of the practical process of development of men. Empty talk about consciousness ceases and real knowledge has to take its place. When reality is depicted, philosophy as an independent branch of knowledge loses its medium of existence. At, at the best, its place can only be taken by a summing up of the most general results. 
abstractions which arise from the observation of the historical development of men. Viewed apart from real history, these abstractions have in themselves no value whatsoever. They can only serve to facilitate the arrangement of historical material to indicate the sequence of its separate strata, but they by no means afford a recipe or schema, as does philosophy, for neatly trimming the epochs of history. The, on the contrary, our difficulties begin only when we set about the observation in the arrangement, the real depiction of our of our historical material, whether of a past epoch or of the present. The removal of these difficulties is governed by premises which it is quite impossible to state here, but which only the study of the actual real but which only the study of the actual real but which only the study of the actual life process and the activity of the individuals of each epoch will make evident. We shall select here some of these abstractions, which we use in contradistinction to the ideologists, and shall illustrate them by historical examples. History. Fundamental Conditions. Since we are dealing with the Germans, who are devoid of premises, we must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence and, therefore, of all history, the premise namely that men must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. But life involves, before everything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing, and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs the production of material life itself. And indeed, this is an historical act, a fundamental condition of all history, which today, as thousands of years ago, must daily and hourly be fulfilled merely in order to sustain human life. Even when the sensuous world is reduced to a minimum, to a stick as with St. Bruno Bear, it presupposes the action of producing the stick. Therefore, in any interpretation of history, one has first of all to observe this fundamental fact in all its significance, in all its implications, and to accord it its due importance. It is well known that the Germans have never done this. They have never, therefore, had an earthly basis for history and consequently never an historian. The French and the English even if they have conceived the relation of this fact with so-called history only in an extremely one-sided fashion, particularly as long as they remain in the toils of political ideology, have nevertheless made the first attempts to give the writing of history a materialistic basis by being the first to write histories of civil society, of commerce, and, in and industry. The second point is that the satisfaction of the first need, the action of satisfying, and the instrument of satisfaction which has been acquired leads to new things, leads to new, leads to new needs. And this production of new needs is the first historical act. Here we recognize immediately the spiritual ancestry of the great historical wisdom of the Germans who, when they run out of positive material, and when they can serve up neither theological nor political, nor literary rubbish, assert that this is not history at all, but the prehistoric era. They do not, however, enlighten us as to how we proceed from this nonsensical prehistory to history proper, although, on the other hand, in their historical speculation, they seize upon this prehistory with, with especial eagerness because they imagine themselves safe there from interference on the part of crude facts, and at the same time, because there they can give full rein to their speculative impulse and set up and knock down hypothesis, hypotheses by the thousand. The third circumstance which, from the very outset, enters into historical development is that men who daily remake their own life begin to make the other men, 
to propagate their kind, the relation between man and woman, parents and children, the family. The family, which to begin with, is the only social relationship, becomes later when increased needs create new social relations and the increased population new needs. A subordinate one, except in Germany, and must then be treated and analyzed according to the existing empirical data, not according to the concept of the family, as is the custom in Germany. These three aspects of social activity are not, of course, to be taken as three different stages, but just as three aspects, or, to make it clear to the Germans, three moments which have existed simultaneously since the dawn of history in the first men, and which still assert themselves in history today. The production of life, both of one's own in labor and of fresh life in procreation, now appears as a double relationship, on the one hand as a natural, on the other as a social relationship. By social, we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, in what manner, and to what end. It follows from this that a certain mode of production of industrial stage it follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Further, that the multitude of productive forces accessible to men determines the nature of, of society, hence that the history of humanity must always be studied and treated in relation to the history of industry and exchange. But it is also clear how in Germany it is impossible to write this sort of history, because the Germans lack not only the necessary power of comprehension in the material, but also the evidence of their senses. For across the Rhine, you cannot have any experience of these things, since history has stopped happening. Thus, it is quite obvious from the start that there exists a materialistic connection of men with one another, which is determined by their needs and their mode of production, and which is as old as men themselves. This connection is ever taking on new forms, and thus presents a history independently of the existence of any political or, or religious nonsense, which in addition may hold men together. Only now, after having considered four moments, for as only now after having consider ap, only now after having considered four moments, four aspects of the primary historical relationships, do we find that man also possesses consciousness, but even so, not inherent, not pure consciousness, from the start. The spirit is afflicted with the curse of being burdened with matter, which here makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sounds, in short, of language. Language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical consciousness that exists also for other men. And for that reason alone, it really exists for me personally as well. Language, like consciousness, only arises from the need, the necessity, of intercourse with other men. Where there exists a relationship, it exists for me. The animal does not enter into relations with anything. It does not enter into any relation at all. For the animal, its relation to others does not exist as a relation. Consciousness is therefore, from the very beginning, a social product and remains so as long as men exist at all. Consciousness is at first, of course, merely consciousness concerning the immediate sensuous environment and consciousness of the limited connection with other persons and things outside the individual who is growing self-conscious. At the same time, it is consciousness of nature which first appears to men as a completely alien, all-powerful, and unassailable force, with which men's relations are purely animal and by which they are over, overruled like beasts. 
It is thus a purely animal consciousness of nature, natural religion, just because nature is as yet hardly modified historically. We see here immediately this natural religion or this particular relation of men to nature is determined by the form of society and vice versa. Here, as everywhere, the identity of nature and man appears in such a way that the restricted relation of men to nature determines their restricted relation to one another, and their restricted relation to one another determines men's restricted relation to nature. On the other hand, man's consciousness of the necessity of associating with the individuals around him is the beginning of the consciousness that he is living in society at all. This beginning is as animal as social life itself at this stage. It is mere herd consciousness, and at this point man is only distinguished from sheep by the fact that with him consciousness takes the place of instinct, or that his instinct is a conscious one. This sheep-like or tribal consciousness receives its further development and extension through increased act through increased productivity, the increase of needs, and what is fundamental to both of these, the increase of population. With these, there develops the division of labor, which was originally nothing but the division of labor in the sexual act. Then that division of labor, which develops spontaneously or naturally by virtue of natural predisposition, e.g. physical strength, needs, accidents, etc., etc. The vision of labor only becomes truly such from the moment when a division of material and mental labor appears. The first form of ideologists, priests, is concurrent. From this moment onwards, consciousness can really flatter itself that it is something other than consciousness of existing practice, that it really represents something without representing something real. From now on, consciousness is in a position to emancipate itself from the world and to proceed to the formation of pure theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. But even if this theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. comes into contradiction with the existing relations, this can only occur because existing social relations have come into contra contradiction with existing forces of production. This, moreover, can also occur in a particular national sphere of relations through the appearance of the contradiction, not within the national orbit, but between this national consciousness and the practice of other nations, i.e., between the nations and the general consciousness of a nation, as we see it now in Germany. Moreover, it is quite immaterial what consciousness starts to do on its own. Out of all such muck, we get only the one inference that these three moments, the forces of production, the state of society, and consciousness can and must come into contradiction with one another, because the division of labor implies the possibility, nay, the fact that intellectual and material activity, enjoyment and labor, production and consumption devolve on different individuals and that the only possibility of their not coming the the only possibility of their not coming into contradiction lies in the negation in its turn of the division of labor it is self-evident moreover that specters bonds the higher being concept scruple are merely the idealistic spiritual expression the conception apparently of the isolated individual, the image of very empirical fetters and limitations within which the mode of production of life and the form of intercourse coupled with it move. Private property and communism. With the division of labor in which all these contradictions are implicit and which in its turn is based on the natural division of labor in the family and the separation of society into individual families opposed to one another, is given simultaneously the distribution, and indeed the unequal distribution, both quantitative and qualitative, of labor and its products. Hence property, the nucleus 
the first form of which lies in the family where wife and children are the slaves of the husband, this latent slavery in the family, though still very crude, is the first property, but even at this early stage, it corresponds perfectly to the definition of modern economists who call it the power of disposing of the labor power of others. Division of labor and private property are, moreover, identical expressions in the one and in the one in in the one the same thing is affirmed with reference to activity as is affirmed in the other with reference to the product of the activity further the division of labor implies the contradiction between the interests of the separate individual or the individual family and the communal interests of all individuals who have intercourse with one another and indeed, this communal interest does not exist merely in the imagination as the general interest, but first of all in reality as the mutual interdependence of the individuals among whom the labor is divided. And finally, the division of labor offers us the first example of how, as long as man remains in natural society, that is, as long as a cleavage exists between the particular in the common interests, as long, therefore, as activity is not voluntary, but naturally divided, man's own deed becomes an alien power opposed to him, which enslaves him instead of being controlled by him. For as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood, while in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. This fixation of social activity, this consolidation of what we ourselves produce into an objective power above us, growing out of our control, thwarting our expectations, bringing to naught our calculations, is one of the chief factors in historical development up till now. The social power, i.e. the multiplied productive force, which arises through the cooperation of different individuals, as it is determined by the division of labor, appears to these individuals, since their cooperation is not voluntary, but has come about naturally, not as their own united power, but as an alien force existing outside them, of the origin and goal of which they are ignorant, which they thus cannot control, which on the contrary passes through a peculiar series of phases and stages independent of the will and the action of man, nay even being the prime governor of these. How otherwise could, for instance, property have had a history at all, have taken on different forms in landed property, for example, according to the different premises given, have proceeded in France from parcellation to centralization in the hands of a few, in England from centralization in the hands of a, of a few to parcellation, as is actually the case today. Or how does it happen that trade, which after all is nothing more than the exchange of products of various individuals and countries, rules the whole world through the relation of supply and demand, a relation which, as the English economist says, hovers over the earth like the fate of the ancients and with invisible hand allots fortune and misfortune to men, sets up, sets up empires and overthrows empires, causes nations to rise and to disappear, while with the abolition of the basis of private property, with the communistic re regulation of production, and implicit in this, the destruction of the alien relation between men and what they themselves produce, 
the power of the relation of supply and demand is is dissolved into nothing, and men get exchange, production, the mode of their mutual relation under their own control again. History as a continuous process in history up to the present, it is certainly an empirical fact that separate individuals have, with the broadening of their activity into world historical activity, become more and more enslaved under a power alien to them, a pressure which they have conceived of as a dirty trick on the part of the so-called universal spirit, etc., a power which has become more and more enormous and, in the last instance, turns out to be the world market, but it is just as empirically established that by the overthrow of the existing state of society by the communist revolution of which more below in the abolition of private property which is identical with it this power which so baffles the german theoreticians will be dissolved and that then the liberation of each single individual will be accomplished in the measure in which history becomes transformed into world history from the above it is clear that the real intellectual wealth of the individual depends entirely on the wealth of his real connections. Only then will the separate individuals be liberated from the various national and local barriers be brought into practical connection with the material and intellectual production of the whole world and be put in a position to acquire the capacity to enjoy this all-sided production of the whole earth, the creations of man, all round dependence, this natural form of the world historical cooperation of individuals will be transformed by this communist revolution into the control and conscious mastery of these powers, which born of the action of men on one another have till now over overawed the govern the governed men as powers completely alien to them. Now this view can be expressed again in speculative, idealistic, i.e. fantastic terms as self-generation of the species, society as the subject, and thereby the consecutive series of interrelated individuals connected with each other can be conceived as a single individual which accomplishes the mystery of generating itself. It is clear here that individuals certainly make one another physically and mentally, but do not make themselves. 5. Development of the productive forces as a material premise of communism. This alienation, to use, the, to use a term which will be comprehensible to the philosophers, can of course only be abolished given two practical premises. For it to become an intolerable power, i.e. a power against which men take a revolution, it must necessarily have rendered the great mass of humanity propertyless and reduced, at the same time, the contradiction of an existing world of wealth and culture, both of which conditions presuppose a great increase in productive power, a high degree of its development. And, and on the other hand, this development of productive forces, which itself implies the actual empirical existence of men in their world historical instead of local being, is an absolutely necessary practical premise because without it, want is merely made general, and with destitution, the struggle for necessities in all the old filthy business would necessarily be re reproduced, and furthermore, because only with this universal development of productive forces is a universal intercourse between men established which produces in all nations simultaneously. The phenomenon of the propertyless mass universal competition makes each nation dependent on the revolutions of the others, and finally has put world historical, empirically universal individuals in place of local ones. Without this, one, communism could only exist as a local event, two, the forces of intercourse themselves could not have developed as, univers as universal, hence intolerable powers. They would have remained home-bred 
conditions surrounded by superstition, and three, each extension of intercourse would abolish local communism. Empirically, communism is only possible as the act of the dominant peoples all at once and simultaneously, which presupposes the universal development of productive forces and the world intercourse bound up with communism. Moreover, the mass of propertyless workers, the utterly precarious position of labor, power on a mass scale cut off from capital or from even a limited satisfaction and therefore no longer merely temporarily deprived of work itself as a secure source of life, presupposes the world market through competition. The proletariat can thus only exist world historically, just as communism, its activity, can only have a world historical existence. World historical existence of individuals means existence of individuals which is directly linked up with world history. Communism is for us not a state of affairs, which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. In the main, we have so far considered only one aspect of human activity, the reshaping of nature by men. The other aspect, the reshaping of men by, by men, intercourse and productive power, origin of the state and the, and the relation of the state to civil society. B. The illusion of the epoch. Civil society in the conception of history. The form of intercourse determined by the existing productive forces at all previous historical stages, and in its turn determining these, is civil society. The latter, as is clear from what we have said above, has as its premises the basis has as its premises and basis the simple family and the multiple the so called tribe. The more precise determinants of this society are enumerated in our remarks above. Already here we see how this civil society is the true source and theater of all history, and how absurd is the conception of history held hitherto, which neglects the real relationships and confines itself to high-sounding dramas of princes and states. Civil society embraces the whole material intercourse of individuals within a definite stage of the development of productive forces. It embraces the whole commercial and industrial life of a given stage and insofar transcends the state and the nation, though on the other hand, again, it must assert itself in its foreign relations as nationality and inwardly must organize itself as state. The word civil society emerged in the 18th century when property relationships had already extricated themselves from the ancient and medieval communal society. The, the civil, civil society as such only develops with the bourgeoisie, the social organization evolving directly out of production and commerce, which in all ages forms the basis of the state and of the rest of the idealistic superstructure, has, however, always been <laughs> designated by the same name. Conclusions from the materialist conception of history. History is nothing but the su su succession of the separate generations, each of which exploits the materials, the capital funds, the productive forces handed down to it by all preceding generations, and thus, on the one hand, continues the traditional activity in completely changed circumstances and, on the other, modifies the old circumstances with a completely changed activity. This can be speculatively distorted so that later history is made the goal of earlier history, e.g., the goal ascribed to the discovery of America is to further the eruption of the French Revolution. Thereby, history receives its own special aims and becomes a person raiding with other persons, to wit, self-consciousness 
criticism, and the unique, etc. While what is designated with the words destiny, goal, germ, or idea of earlier history is nothing more than an abstraction formed from later history from the active influence which earlier history exercises on later history, the further the separate spheres which interact on one another extend in the course of this development, the more the original isolation of the separate nationalities is destroyed by the developed mode of production and intercourse and the division of labor between various nations naturally brought forth by these. The more history becomes world history. Thus, for instance, if in England a machine is invented which deprives countless workers of bread in India and China and overturns the whole form of existence of these empires, this invention becomes a world historical fact. Or again, take the case of sugar and coffee which have proved their world historical importance in the 19th century by the fact that the lack of these products occasioned by the Napoleonic continental system caused the Germans to rise against Napoleon and thus became the real basis of the glorious wars of liberation of 1813. From this, it follows that this transformation of history into world history is not indeed a mere abstract act on the part of the self-consciousness, the world, spirit, or of any other metaphysical specter, but a quite material, empirically verifiable act, an act the proof of which every individual furnishes as he comes and goes, eats, drinks, and clothes himself. 7. Summary of the Materialist Conception of History This conception of history depends on our ability to expound the real process of production, starting out from the material product from the material production of life itself and to comprehend the form of intercourse connected with this and created by this mode of production i.e civil society in its various stages as the basis of all history and to show it in its action as state to explain all the different theoretical products and forms of consciousness religion philosophy ethics etc etc and trace their origins and growth from that basis by which means, of course, the whole thing can be depicted in its totality, and therefore, too, the reciprocal action of these various sides on one another. It is not like the idealistic view of history in every period to look for a category, but remains constantly on the real ground of history. It does not explain practice from the idea, but explains the formation of ideas from material practice. And accordingly, it comes to the conclusion that all forms and products of consciousness cannot be dissolved by mental criticism, by resolution into self-consciousness, or transformation into apparitions, specters, fancies, etc., but only by the practical overthrow of the actual social relations which gave rise to this idealistic humbug, that not criticism, but revolution is the driving force of history also of religion, of philosophy, and all other types of theory. It shows that history does not end by being resolved into self-consciousness as spirit of the spirit, but that in it at each stage there is found a material result, a sum of productive forces, an historically created relation of individuals to nature and to one another, which is handed down to each generation from its predecessor, a mass of productive forces, capital funds, and conditions, which on the one hand is indeed modified by the new generation, but also on the other prescribes for it its conditions of life and gives it a definite development, a special character. It shows that circumstances make men just as much as men make circumstances. This sum of productive forces capital funds and social forms of intercourse which every individual and generation finds in existence as something given is the real basis of what the philosophers have conceived as substance and essence of man and what they have de defied and attacked 
and, and what they have deified, deified and attacked. A real basis which is not in the least disturbed in its effect and influence on the development of men by the fact that these philosophers revolt against it as self-consciousness and the unique. These conditions of life which different generations find in existence decide also whether or not the periodically recurring revolutionary convulsion will be strong enough to overthrow the basis of the entire existing system. And if these material elements of a complete revolution are not present, namely on the one hand, the existing productive forces, on the other, the formation of a revolutionary mass, which revolts not only against separate conditions of, of society up till then, but against the very production of life till then, the total activity on which it was based. Then, as far as practical development is concerned, it is absolutely immaterial whether the idea of this revolution has been expressed a hundred times already, as the history of communism proves. 8. 8. The inconsistency of the idealist conception of history, in general, and of German post-Hegelian philosophy in, gen in particular. In the whole conception of history up to the present, this real basis of history has either been totally neglected or else considered as a minor matter quite irrelevant to the course of history. History must, therefore, always be written according to an extra extraneous standard. The real production of life seems to be primeval history, while the truly historical ap appears to be separated from ordinary life, something extra super, super terrestrial. With this, the relation of man to nature is excluded from history, and, the, and hence the antithesis of nature and history is created. The exponents of this conception of history have consequently only been able to see in history the political actions of princes and states religious in all sorts of, the of theoretical struggles, and in particular, in each historical epoch, have had to share the illusion of that epoch. For instance, if an epoch imagines itself to be actuated by purely political or, or religious motives, although religion and politics are only forms of its true motives, the historian accepts this opinion. The idea the conception of the people in question about their real practice is transformed into the sole determining active force, which, which controls and determines their practice. When the crude form in which the division of labor appears, with the Indians and, Eg and Egyptians calls forth the case system in their state and religion, the historian believes that the case system is the power which has produced this crude social form. While the French and the English at least held, at least hold by the political illusion, which is moderately close to reality, the Germans move in the realm of the pure spirit and make religious illusion the driving force of history. The Hegelian philosophy of history is the last consequence reduced to its finest expression of all this German historiography for which it is not a, a question of real, nor even of political, interests, but of pure thoughts which consequently must appear to St. Bruno as a series of thoughts that devour one another and are finally swallowed up in self-consciousness. Marginal Note by Marx So-called objective historiography consisted precisely in treating the historical relations separately from activity, reactionary character, and even more consistently, the, his the course of history must appear to St. Max Stirner, who knows not a thing about real history, as a mere tale of knights, robbers, and ghosts, from whose visions he can, of course, only save himself by unhol unholiness. This conception is truly religious. It postulates religious man as the primitive man, the starting point of history, and in its imagination puts the religious production of fancies in the place of the real production of the means of subsistence and of life itself. The whole conception of history, together with its dissolution,
and the scruples and calms resulting from it is a purely national affair of the Germans and has merely local interests for Germany. As for instance, the important question which has been under discussion in recent times, how exactly one passes from the realm of God to the realm of man, what would what would Fierbach, Uber das Weisen des Christenthums, as if this realm of God had ever existed anywhere save in the imagination, and the learned gentlemen, without being aware of it, were not constantly living in the realm of man to which they are now seeking the way, and as if the learned pastime, for it is nothing more of explaining the mystery of this theoretical bubble blowing, did not, on the contrary, lie in demonstrating its origin in actual earthly relations. For these Germans, it is altogether simply a matter of resolving the ready-made nonsense they find into some other freak, i.e., of presupposing that all this nonsense has a special sense which can be discovered, while really it is only a question of explaining these theoretical phrases from the actual existing relations. The real, practical dissolution of these phrases, the removal of these notions from the consciousness of men, will, as we have already said, be affected by altered circumstances, not by theoretical deductions. For the mass of men, i.e. the proletariat, these theoretical notions do not exist and hence do not require to be dissolved. And if this mass ever had any theoretical notions, e.g. religion, these have now long been dissolved by circumstances. The purely national character of these questions and solutions is moreover shown by the fact that these theorists believe in all seriousness that chimeras like the good man, man, etc., have presided over individual epochs of history. Saint Bruno even, go, even goes so far as to assert that only criticism and critics have made history. And when they themselves construct historical systems, they skip over all earlier periods in the greatest haste and pass immediately from Mongolism to history with meaningful content, that is to say, to the history of the Halish and Deutsch Jarbuscher and the dissolution of the Egalian school into a general squabble. They forget all other nations, all real events, and the, the Theatrum Mundi is confined to the Leipzig Book Fair and the mutual quarrels of criticism Bruno Bear man Ludwig Feerbach and the unique Max Stirner. If for once these theorists treat really historical subjects, as for instance the 18th century, they merely give a history of ideas separated from the facts and the practical development underlying them, and even that merely in order to represent that period as an imperfect preliminary st stage. The as yet limited predecessor of the truly historical age, i.e., the period of the German philosophic struggle from 1840 to 1844. As might be expected, when the history of an earlier period is written with the aim of accentuating the brilliance of an unhistoric person and his fantasies, all the really historic events, even the really historic interventions, of politics and history receive no mention. Instead, we get a narrative based not on research, but on arbitrary constructions and literary gossip, such as St. Bruno provided in his now forgotten history of the 18th century. These pompous and arrogant hucksters of ideas who imagine themselves infinitely exalted above all national prejudices are thus in practice far more national than the beer-swilling Philistines who dream of a united Germany. They do not recognize the deeds of other nations as historical. They live in Germany, within Germany, 1281, and for, and for Germany. They turn the Rhine song into a religious heim and conquer 
Alsace and Lorraine by robbing French philosophy instead of the French state by Germanizing French ideas instead of French provinces. Herr Venedy is a cosmopolitan compared with the saints Bruno and Max, who, in the universal dominance of theory, proclaim the universal dominance of Germany. Fierbach, Philosophic and Real Liberation It is also clear from these arguments who gross, how grossly Fierbach is deceiving himself when Wigan's Vertelgar's Schrift, 1845 Band 2, by virtue of the qualification common man, he declares himself a communist. It is also clear from these arguments how grossly Fierbach is deceiving himself when, by virtue of the qualification common man, he declares himself a communist, transforms the latter into a predicate of man, and thereby thinks it possible to change the word communist, which in the real world means the follower of a definite revolutionary party, into a mere category. Fierbach's whole deduction with regard to the relation of men to one another goes only so far as to prove that men need and always have needed each other. He wants to establish consciousness of this fact, that is to say, like the other theorists, merely to produce a correct consciousness about an existing fact, whereas for the real communists, it is a question of overthrowing the existing state of things. We thoroughly appreciate, moreover, that Fierbach in it, in in endeavoring to produce consciousness of just this fact, is going so far as a theorist possibly can without ceasing to be a theorist and philosopher. As an example of Fierbach's acceptance and at the same time misunderstanding of existing reality, which he still shares with our opponents, we recall the passage in the Philosophy der Zukunft where he develops the view that the existence of a, of a thing or a man is at the same time its or its or his essence, that the conditions of existence, the mode of life and activity of an animal or human individual, are those in which its essence feels, its, feels itself satisfied. Here, every exception is expressly conceived as an unhappy chance, as an abnormality which cannot be altered. Thus, if millions of proletarians feel by no means contented with their, li with their living conditions, if their existence does not in the least correspond to their essence, then according to the passage quoted, this is an un unavoidable misfortune, which must be borne quietly. The millions of proletarians and communists, however, think differently, and will prove this in time when they bring their existence into harmony with their essence in a practical way, by means of a revolution. Fierbach, therefore, never speaks of the world of man in such cases, but always takes refuge in external nature, and moreover in nature which has not yet been subdued by men. But every new invention, every advance made by industry detaches another piece from this domain, so that the ground which produces examples illustrating such fear batching propositions is steadily shrinking the essence of the of the fish is its being water to go no further than this one proposition the essence of the fresh water fish is the water of a river but the latter ceases to be the essence of the fish and is no longer a suitable medium of existence as soon as the river is made to serve industry. As soon as it is polluted by dyes and other waste products and navigated by steamboats, or as soon as its water is diverted into canals where simple drainage can deprive the fish of its medium of existence, the explanation that all such contradictions are inevitable abnormalities does not essentially differ from the consolation which St. Max Sterner offers to the disc discontented saving that this contradiction is their own contradiction and this pre predicament their own pre pre predicament whereupon then should either set their minds at ease keep their disgust to themselves or revolt against it in some fantastic way
It differs just as little from St. Bruno's allegation that these unfortunate circumstances are due to the fact that the that those concerned are stuck in the muck of substance have not advanced to absolute self-consciousness and do not realize that these adverse conditions are spirit of their spirit. Two, one, preconditions of the real liberation of man. We shall, of course, not take the trouble to enlighten our wise philosophers by explaining to them that the liberation of man is not advanced a single step by reducing philosophy, theology, substance, and all the trash to self-consciousness, and by liberating man from the domination of these phrases, which have never held him in thrall, nor will we explain to them that it is only possible to achieve real liberation in the real world and by employing real means, that slavery cannot be abolished without the steam engine and the mule and spinning jenny, serfdom cannot be abolished without improved agriculture, and that, in general, people cannot be liberated as long as they are unable to obtain food and drink housing and clothing in adequate quality and quantity. Liberation is an historical and not a mental act, and it is brought about by historical conditions. The development of industry, commerce, agriculture, the conditions of intercourse, there is here a gap in the manuscript. In Germany, a country where only a trivial historical development is taking place, these mental developments these glorified and ineffective trivialities naturally serve as a substitute for the lack of historical development, and they take root and have to be combated. But this fight is of, is of local importance. 2. Fierbatch's contemplative and inconsistent materialism. In reality, and for the practical materialists, i.e., the communists, it is a question of revolutionizing the existing world, of practically attacking and changing existing things. When occasionally we find such views with fear batch, they are never more than isolated surmises ser and have much too little influence on his general outlook to be considered here as anything else than embryos capable of development. Fear batch's conception of the sensuous world is confined on the one hand to be mere contemplation of it, and on the other to mere feeling. He says man instead of real historical man. Man is really the German. In the first case, the contemplation of the sensuous world, he necessarily lights on things which contradict his consciousness and feeling, which disturb the harmony he presupposes the harmony of all parts of the sensuous world, and especially of man and nature. To remove this disturbance, he must take refuge in a double perception, a, prof a profane one which only perceives the flatly obvious, and a higher philosophical one which perceives the true essence of things. He does not see how the sensuous world around him is not a thing given directly from all eternity, remaining ever the same, but the product of, in, of industry and of the state of society, and, and indeed, in the sense that it is in historical products, the result of the activity of a whole succession of generations, each standing on the shoulders of the preceding one, developing its industry and its intercourse, modifying its social system according to the changed needs. Even the objects of the simplest sensuous certainty are only given him through social development, industry, and commercial intercourse. The cherry tree, like almost all fruit trees, was, as is well known, only a few centuries ago transplanted by commerce into our zone, and therefore only by this action of a definite society in a definite age it has become sensuous certainty for fear batch. Incidentally, when we conceive things thus as they really are and happened, every profound philosophical problem is resolved, as will be seen even more clearly later.
quite simply into an empirical fact. For instance, the important question of the relation of man to nature, Bruno Baer, goes so far as to speak of the antithesis in nature and history as though these were two separate things and man did not always have before him an historical nature and a natural history out of which all the unfathomably lofty works on substance and self-consciousness were born crumbles of itself when we understand that the celebrated unity of man with nature has always existed in industry and has existed in varying forms in every epoch according to the lesser of greater development of industry just like the struggle of man with nature right up to the development of his productive powers on a corresponding basis industry and commerce production and the exchange of the of the necessities of life themselves determine distribution the structure of the different social classes and are in turn determined by it as to the mode in which they are carried on and so it happens that in manchester for instance your batch sees only factories and machines where a hundred years ago only spinning wheels and weaving rooms were to be seen or in the com compagna of rome he finds only pasture lands and swamps where in the time of augustus he would have found nothing but the vineyards and villas of Roman capitalists. Fierbach speaks in particular of the perception of natural science. He mentions secrets which are disclosed only to the eye of the physicists and chemists. But where would natural science be, be without industry and commerce? Even this pure natural science is provided with an aim, as with its material, only through trade and industry, through the sensuous activity of men. So much is this activity, this unceasing sensuous labor in creation, this production, the basis of the whole sensuous world as it now exists, that where, where it interrupted only for a year, Feuerbach would not only find an enormous change in the natural world, but would very soon find that the whole world of men in his own perceptive faculty, nay his own existence, were missing. Of course, in all this, the priority of external nature remains unassailed, and all this has no application to the original men produced by generatio equivoca, spon spontaneous generation, but this differentiation has meaning only insofar as man is considered to be distinct from nature. For that matter, nature, the nature that preceded human history, is not by any means the nature in which Fierbach lives. It is nature which today no longer exists anywhere, except perhaps on a few Australian coral islands of recent origin, and which, therefore, does not exist for Fierbach. Certainly, Fierbach has a great advantage over the pure materialist in that he realizes how man, too, is an object of the senses, but apart from the fact that he only conceives him as an object of the senses, not as sensuous activity, because he still remains in the realm of theory and conceives of men not in their given social connection, not under their existing conditions of life, which have made them what they are he never arrives at the really existing active men but stops at the abstraction man and gets no further than recognizing the true individual corporeal man emotionally i.e he knows no other human relationships of man to man than love and friendship and even then idealized he gives no criticism of the present conditions of life Thus, he never manages to conceive the sensuous world as the total living sensuous activity of the individuals composing it. And therefore, when, for example, he sees instead of healthy men, a crowd of scrofulous, overworked, and consumptive starvelings, he is compelled to take refuge in the higher perception and in the ideal compensation in the species and thus to relapse into idealism at the very point 
were that communist materialists sees ne the necessity and at the same time the condition of a transformation both of industry and of the social structure. As far as Feuerbach is a materialist, he does not deal with history, and as far as he considers history, he is not a materialist. With him, materialism and history diverge completely, a fact which incidentally is already obvious from what has been said. Ruling Class and Ruling Ideas The ruling ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, i.e., the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production, so that thereby, generally speaking, the ideas of those who, who lack the means of mental production are subject to it. The ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships, the dominant material relationships grasp as ideas. Hence, of the relationships which make the one class the ruling one, therefore, the ideas of its dominance, the individuals composing the ruling class possess, among other things, consciousness, and therefore think. Insofar, therefore, as they rule as a class and determine the extent and compass of an epoch, it is self-evident that they do this in its whole range. Hence, among other things, rule also as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of the ideas of their age. Thus, their ideas are the ruling ideas of the epoch. For instance, in, in an age and in a country where, ro where royal power, aristocracy, and bourgeoisie are contending for mastery and where, therefore, mastery is shared, the doctrine of the separation of powers proves to be the dominant idea and is expressed as an eternal law. The division of labor, which we already saw above, as one of the chief forces of history up till now, manifests itself also in the ruling class as the division of mental and material labor, so that inside this class one part appears as the thinkers of the class, its active conceptive ideologists, who make the perfecting of the illusion of the class about itself their chief source of livelihood, while the other's attitude to these ideas and illusions is more passive and receptive because they are in reality the active members of this class and have less time to make up illusions and ideas about themselves. Within this class, this cleavage can even develop into a certain opposition and hostility between the two parts, which, however, in the case of a practical collision in which the class itself is endangered, automatically comes to nothing, in which case there also vanishes the semblance that the ruling ideas were not the ideas of the ruling class and had a power distinct from the power of this class. The existence of revolutionary ideas in a particular period presupposes the existence of a revolutionary class. About the premises for the latter sufficient has already been said above. If now in considering the course of history we detach the ideas of the ruling class from the ruling class itself and attribute to them an independent existence. If we confine ourselves to saying that these or those ideas were dominant at a given time without bothering ourselves about the conditions of production and the producers of these ideas, if we thus ignore the individuals and world conditions which are the source of the ideas, we can say, for instance, that during the time that the aristocracy was dominant, the conceptions, the concepts, honor, loyalty, etc., were dominant. During the dominance of the bourgeoisie, the concepts, freedom, equality, etc., the ruling class itself, on the whole, imagines this to be so. This conception of history, which is common to all historians, particularly since the 18th century,
who ne will necessarily come up against the phenomenon that increasingly abstract ideas hold sway, i.e. ideas which increasingly take on the form of universality. For each new class which puts itself in the place of, of one ruling before it is compelled merely in order to carry through its aim to represent its interests as the common interests of all the members of society. That is, expressed in ideal form, it has to give its ideas the form of universality and represent them as the only rational, universally valid ones. The class making a revolution appears from the very start, if only because it is opposed to a class, not as a class, but as the representative of the whole of society. It appears as the whole mass of society confronting the one ruling class. Marginal note by Marx. Universality corresponds to 1. The class versus the estate. 2. The competition, worldwide intercourse, etc. 3. The great numerical strength of the ruling class. 4. The illusion of the common interests. In the beginning, this illusion is true. 5. The delusion of the ideologists and the division of labor. It can do this because, to start with, its interest really is more connected with the common interests of all other non-ruling classes because under the pressure of hitherto existing conditions, its interest has not yet been able to develop as the particular interests of a particular class. Its victory, therefore, benefits also many individuals of the other classes which are not winning a dominant position but only insofar as it now puts these individuals in a position to raise themselves into the ruling class. When the French bourgeoisie overthrew the power of the aristocracy, it thereby made it possible for many proletarians to raise themselves above the proletariat, but only insofar as they become bourgeois. Every new class, therefore, achieves its hegemony, only on a broader basis than that of the class ruling previously, whereas the, op whereas the opposition of the non-ruling class against the new ruling class later, de later develops all the more sharp sharply and profoundly. Both these things determine the fact that the struggle to be waged against this new ruling class in its term aims at a more decided and radical negation of the previous conditions of society than could all previous classes which sought to rule. This whole semblance that the role of a certain class is only the role of certain ideas comes to a natural end, of course, as soon as, cl as class rule in general ceases to be the form in which society is organized. That is to say, as soon as it is no longer necessary to represent a particular interest as general or the general interest as ruling. Once the ruling ideas have been separated from the ruling individuals and, above all, from the relationships which result from a given stage of the mode of production, and in this way the conclusion has been reached that history is always under the sway of ideas, it is very easy to abstract from these various ideas the idea, the notion, etc., as the dominant force in history, and thus to understand all these separate ideas and concepts as forms of self-determination on the part of the concept developing in history. It follows then naturally, too, that all the relationships of men can be derived from the concept of man, man as conceived, the essence of man, man. This has been done by the speculative philosophers. Hegel himself confesses at the end of the Gestish philosophy that he has considered the progress of the concept only and has represented in history the true theodicy. Now one can go back again to the producers of the concept, to the theorists, ideologists, and philosophers, and one comes then to the conclusion that the philosophers the thinkers as such have at all times been dominant in history. A conclusion, as we see, already expressed by Hegel, the whole trick of proving the hegemony of the spirit in history, hierarchy, Stirner calls it, 
is thus confined to the following three efforts. Number one, one must separate the ideas of those ruling for empirical reasons under empirical conditions and as empirical individuals from these actual rulers and thus recognize the rule of ideas or illusions in history. Number two, one must bring an order into this rule of ideas, prove a, prove a mystical connection among the successive ruling ideas, which is managed by understanding them as acts of self-determination on the part of the concept. This is possible because by virtue of their empirical basis, these ideas are really connected with one another, and because conceived as mere ideas, they become self-distinctions, distinctions made by thought. Number three, to remove the mystical appearance of this self-determining concept, it is changed into a person, self-consciousness, or to appear thoroughly materialistic into a series of persons who represent the concept in history into the thinkers, the philosophers, the ideologists, who again are understood as the manufacturers of history as the council of guardians, as the rulers, thus the whole body of materialistic elements has been removed from history, and now full reign can be given to the speculative steed. Whilst in, or whilst in ordinary life, every shopkeeper is very well able to distinguish between what somebody professes to be and what he really is, our historians have not yet won even this trivial insight. They take every epoch at its word and believe that everything it says and imagines about itself is true. This historical method, which, which reigned in Germany, and especially the reason why, mu must be understood from its connection with the illusion of ideologists in general, e.g. the illusions of the jurists, politicians of the practical statesmen among them, too, from the dogmatic dreamings and distortions of these fellows. This is explained perfectly easily from their pract practical position in life, their job, and the division of labor. C. The real basis of ideology. Division of labor. Town and country. 1. From the first, there follows the premise of a highly developed division of labor in an extensive commerce. From the second, the locality. In the first case, the individuals must be brought together. In the second, they find themselves alongside the given instrument of production as instruments of production themselves. Here, therefore, arises the difference between natural instruments of production and those created by civilization. The field, water, etc. can be regarded as a natural instrument of production. In the first case, that of the natural instrument of production individuals are subservient to nature, in the second, to a product of, of labor. In the first case, therefore, property, landed property, appears as direct natural domination, in the second, as domination of labor, particularly of accumulated labor, capital. The first case presupposes that the individuals are united by some bond, family, tribe, the land itself, etc. The second, that they are independent of one another and are only held together by exchange. In the first case, what is involved is chiefly an exchange between men and nature in which the labor of the former is exchanged for the products of the, of the latter. In the second, it is pr predominantly an exchange of men among themselves. In the first case, average human common sense is adequate. Physical activity is as yet not separated from mental activity. In the second, the division between physical and mental labor must already be practically completed. In the first case, the domination of the proprietor over the propertyless may be based on a personal relationship, on a kind of community. In the second, it must have taken on a material shape in a third party, money. In the first case, small industry exists but determined by the utilization of the natural instrument of production, and therefore without the distribution of labor among various individuals, in the second, 
Industry exists only in and through the division of labor. Two, the division of material and mental labor. Separation of town and country, the guild system. The greatest division of material and mental labor is the separation of town and country. The antagonism between town and country begins with the transition from barbarism to civilization, from tribe to state, from locality to nation, and runs through the whole history of civilization to the present day, the Anti-Corn Law League. The existence of the town implies, at the same time, the necessity of administration, police, taxes, etc. In short, of the municipality and thus of politics in general. Here first became manifest the division of the population into two great classes, which is directly based on the division of labor and on the instruments of production. The town already is in actual fact the concentration of the population, of the instruments of production, of capital, of pleasures, of needs, while the country demonstrates just the opposite fact isolation and, separate, and separation. The antagonism between town and country can only exist within the framework of private property. It is the most, it is the most crass expression of the subjection of the individual under the division of labor, under a definite activity forced upon him, a subjection which makes one man into a restricted town animal, the other into a restricted country animal, and daily creates a new the conflict between their interests. Labor is here again the chief thing, power over individuals, and as long, and as, long as the latter exists, private property must exist. The abolition of the antagonism between town and country is one of the first conditions of communal life, a condition which again depends on a mass of material premises and which cannot be fulfilled by the mere will. As anyone can see at the at the first glance, these conditions have still ha, ha, these conditions have still to be enumerated. The separation of town and country can also be understood as the separation of capital and landed property, as the beginning of the existence and development of capital independent of landed property, the beginning of property having its basis only in labor and exchange. In the towns which in the Middle Ages did not derive ready-made from an earlier period, but were formed anew by the serfs who had become free, each man's own particular labor was his only property apart from the small capital he brought with him, consisting almost solely of the, of the, of the most necessary tools of his craft. The competition of serfs constantly escaping into the town the constant war of the country against the towns, and thus ne the necessity of an organized municipal military force. The bond of common ownership in a particular kind of labor, the necessity of common buildings for the sale of their wares at a time when craftsmen were also traders, and the consequent exclusion of the unauthorized from these buildings, the conflict among the interests of the various crafts, the necessity of protecting their laboriously acquired skill and the feudal organization of the whole of the country. These were the causes of the, of the union of the workers of each craft and guilds. We have not at this point to go further into the manifold modifications of the guild system, which arise through later historical developments. The flight of the serfs into the towns went on without interruption right through the Middle Ages, these serfs, persecuted by their lords in the country, came separately into the towns, where they found an organized community against which they were powerless, and in which they had to subject themselves to the station assigned to them by the demand for their labor in the interests of their organized urban com competitors. These workers, entering separately, were never able to attain to any power since if their labor was of the guild type, which had to be learned, the guild masters bent them to their will and organized them according to their interests. Or if their labor was not such as had to be learned, and therefore not of the guild type, 
they became day laborers and never managed to organize remaining and never managed to organize remaining in unorganized rabble. The need for day laborers in the towns created the rabble. These towns were true associations called forth by the direct need, the care of providing for the protection of property and of multiplying the means of production and defense of the separate members. The rabble of these towns was devoid of any power, composed as it was of individuals strange to one another who had entered separately and who stood unorganized over against an un organized power armed for war and jealously watching over them. The journeymen and apprentices were organized in each craft as it best suited the interests of the masters. The patriarchal relationship existing between them and their masters gave the latter a double power, on the one hand because of their influence on the whole life of the journeymen, and on the other because for the journeymen who worked with the same master, it was a real bond which held them together against the journeymen of other masters and separated them from these. And finally, the journeymen were bound to the existing order by their simple interest in becoming masters themselves, while, therefore, the rabble at least carried out revolts against the whole municipal order, revolts which remained completely ineffective because of their powerlessness. The journeymen never got further than small acts of insubordination within separate guilds, such as belong to the very nature of the guild system. The great risings of the Middle Ages all radiated from the country, but equally remained totally ineffective because of the isolation and consequent crudity of the peasants. In the towns, the division of labor between the individual guilds was as yet quite naturally derived, and in the guilds themselves, not at all developed between the individual workers. Every workman had to be versed in a whole round of tasks, had to be able to make everything that was to be made with his tools. The limited commerce in the, in the scanty communication between the individual towns, the lack of population and the narrow needs did not allow of a higher division of labor. And therefore, every man who wished to become a master had to be proficient in the whole of his craft. Thus, there is found with medieval craftsmen an interest in their special work and in proficiency in, in it, which was capable of rising to a narrow artistic sense. For this very reason, however, every medieval craftsman was completely absorbed in his work, to which he had a contented, slavish relationship, and to which he was subjected to a far greater extent than the modern worker whose work is a matter of indifference to him. Capital in these towns was a naturally derived capital consisting of a house, the tools of the craft, and the natural hereditary customers, and not being realizable in account of the backwardness of commerce and the lack of circulation. It descended from father to son. Unlike modern capital, which can be assessed in money and which may be in indifferently invested in this thing or that, this capital was directly connected with the particular work of the owner, inseparable from it, and to this extent as state capital. Further division of labor. The next extension of the division of labor was the separation of production and commerce, the formation of a special class of merchants, a separation which in the towns bequeathed by a former period, had been handed down, among other things, with, with the Jews, and which very soon appeared in the newly formed ones. With this, there was given the possibility of commercial communications transcending the immediate neighborhood, a possibility, the realization of which depended on the existing means of communication, the state of public safety in the countryside, which was determined by political conditions during the whole of the Middle Ages. As is well known, the merchants traveled in armed caravans and on the cruder or more advanced needs determined by the stage of culture attained, 
of the of the region is susceptible to intercourse with commerce, the prerogative of a particular class with the extension of trade through the merchants beyond the immediate surroundings of the town, there immediately appears a reciprocal action between production and commerce. The towns enter into relations with one another. New tools are brought from one town into the other, and the separation between production and commerce soon calls forth a new division of production between the individual towns, each of which is soon exploiting a predominant branch of industry. The local restrictions of earlier times begin gradually to be broken down. It begins purely on the extension of commerce, whether the productive forces achieved in a lo locality, especially inventions, are lost for later development or not. As long as there exists no commerce transcending the immediate neighborhood, every invention must be made separately in each locality, and mere chances such as e eruptions of barbaric peoples, even ordinary wars, are sufficient to cause a country with advanced productive forces and needs to have to start right over again from the beginning. In primitive history, every invention had to be made daily anew, and in each locality independently. How little highly how little highly developed productive forces are safe from complete destruction, give, given even a relatively very extensive commerce, is pr proved by the Phoenicians, whose, whose inventions were for the most part lost for a long time to come. Through the ousting of this nation from commerce, its conquest by Alexander, and its, con and its consequent decline, Likewise, for instance, glass painting in the Middle Ages, only, only when commerce has become world commerce and has as its basis large-scale industry, when all nations are drawn into the competitive struggle, is the permanence of the acquired productive forces assured. The rise of manufacturing, the immediate co consequence of the division of labor, between the various towns was the rise of manufacturers, branches of production which had outgrown the guild system. Manufacturers first flourished in Italy and later in Flanders under the historical premise of commerce with foreign nations. In other countries, England and France for example, manufacturers were at first confined to the home market. Besides the premises already mentioned, Manufacturers depend on an already advanced concentration of population, particularly in the countryside, and of capital, which began to accumulate in the hands of individuals, partly in the guilds in spite of the guild regulations, partly among the merchants. That labor, which from the first presupposed a machine, even of the crudest sort, soon showed itself the most capable of development. Weaving earlier carried on in the country by the peasants as a secondary occupation to procure their clothing was the first labor to receive an impetus in a further development through the extension of commerce. Weaving was the first and remained the principal manufacturer. The rising demand for clothing materials consequent on the growth of population the growing accumulation and mobilization of natural capital through accelerated circulation, the demand for luxuries called forth by the latter and favored generally by the gradual extension of commerce gave weaving a quantitative and qualitative stimulus which, which wrenched it out of the form of production hitherto existing. Alongside the peasants weaving for their own use, who continued and still continue with this sort of work, there emerged a new class of weavers in the towns, whose fabrics were destined for the whole home market, and usually for foreign markets too. Weaving an occupation demanding in most case, cases little skill and soon splitting up into countless branches, by its whole nature resisted the trammels of the guild. Weaving was, therefore, 
carried on mostly in villages and market centers without guild organization, which gradually became towns, and indeed the most flourishing towns in each land. With guild-free manufacture, property relations also quickly changed. The first advance beyond naturally derived estate capital was provided by the rise of merchants, whose capital was from the beginning movable, capital in the modern sense as far as one can speak of it, given the circumstances of those times. The second advance came into many came the second advance came with manufacture, which again made mobile a mass of natural capital, and altogether increased the mass of movable capital as against that of natural capital. At the same time, Manufacture became a refuge of the peasants from the guilds which excluded them or paid them badly. Just as earlier, the guild towns had served as a refuge for the peasants from the oppressive landed nobility. Simultaneously, with the beginning of manufactures, there was a period of vague bondage caused by the abolition of the feudal bodies of retainers. The disbanding of the swollen armies which had flocked to serve the kings against their vassals, the improvement of agriculture, and the transformation of great strips of tillage into pasture land. From this alone, it is clear how this vague bondage is strictly connected with the disintegr disintegration of the feudal system. As early as the 13th century, we find isolated epochs of this kind, but only at the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th does this vagabondage make a general and permanent appearance. These vagabonds, who were so numerous that, for instance, Henry V. V. 111 of England had 72,000 of them hanged, were only prevailed upon to work with the greatest difficulty and through the most extreme necessity and then only after long resistance, the rapid rise of manufacturers, particularly in England, absorbed them gradually. With the advent of manufacturers, the various nations entered into a competitive relationship. The struggle for trade, which was fought out in wars, protective duties, and prohibitions, whereas earlier, the nations, insofar as they were connected at all, had carried on in inoffensive exchange with each other. Trade had from now on a political significance. With the advent of manufacture, the relationship between worker and employer changed. In the guilds, the patriarchal relationship between journeyman and master continued to exist. In manufacture, its place was taken by the monetary relation between worker and capitalist, a relationship which in the countryside and in small towns retained a patriarchal tinge, but in the larger, the real manufacturing towns, quite early lost almost all patriarchal complexion. Manufacture and the movement of production in general received an enormous impetus through the extension of commerce, which came with the discovery of America and the sea route to the East Indies. The new products imported thence particularly the masses of gold and silver, which came into circulation and totally changed the position of the classes towards one another, dealing a hard blow to feudal landed property and to the workers, the, the, ex the expeditions of adventurers, colonization, and above all, the extension of markets into a world market, which had now become possible was daily becoming more and more a fact, called forth a new phase of historical development into which, in general, we cannot here enter further. Through the colonization of the newly discovered countries, the commercial struggle of the nations amongst one another was given new fuel and accordingly greater extension and animosity. The expansion of trade and manufacture accelerated the accumulation of movable capital while in the guilds, which were not stimulated to extend their production, natural capital remained stationary or even declined. Trade and manufacture created the big bourgeoisie. In the guilds was concentrated the petty bourgeoisie, 
which no longer was dominant in the towns as formerly, but had to bow to the might of the great merchants and manufacturers. manufacturers. Hence, the decline of the guilds. As soon as they came into contact with manufacture, the intercourse of nations took on, in the epoch of which we have been speaking, two different forms. At first, the small quantity of gold and silver in circulation involved the ban on the export of these metals in industry, for the most part imported from abroad and made necessary by the need for employing the growing urban population, could not do without those privileges, which could be granted not only, of course, against home competition, but chiefly against foreign. The local guild privilege was in these original prohibitions extended over the whole nation. Customs Customs duties originated from the tributes which the feudal lords exacted as protective levies against robbery from merchants passing through their territories. Tributes later imposed likewise by the towns, in which, with the rise of the modern states, were the treasury's most obvious means of raising money. The appearance of American gold and silver on the European markets the gradual development of industry, the rapid expansion of trade, and the consequent rise of the non-guild bourgeoisie of money gave these measures another significance. The state, which was daily less and less able to do without money, now retained the ban on the export of gold and silver out of fiscal considerations. The bourgeois, for whom these masses of money, which, which were hurled into the market became the chief subject, became the chief object of speculative buying, were thoroughly content with this. Privileges established earlier became a source of income for the government and were sold for money. In the customs legislation, there appeared the export duty, which, since it only placed a hindrance in the way of industry, had a purely fiscal aim. The second period began in the middle of the 17th century and lasted almost to the end of the 18th. 18th. Commerce and navigation had expanded more rapidly than manufacture, which played a secondary role. The colonies were becoming considerable consumers, and after long struggles, the separate nations shared out the opening world market among themselves. This period begins with the navigation laws and colonial monopolies. The competition of the nations among themselves was excluded as far as possible by tariffs, prohibitions, and treaties, and in the last resort, the competitive struggle was carried on and decided by wars, especially naval wars. The mightiest maritime nation, the English, retained preponderance in trade and manufacture. Here already, we find concentration in one country. Manufacture was all the time sheltered by protective duties in the home market, by monopolies in the colonial market, and abroad as much as possible by differential duties. The working up of home produced material was encouraged. Wool and, li wool and linen in England, silk in France, the export of home-produced raw material forbidden wool in England and the working up of imported material neglected or suppressed cotton in England, the nation dominant in sea trade and colonial power naturally secured for itself also the greatest quantitative and qualitative expansion of manufacture. Manufacture could not be carried on without protection, since if the slightest change takes place in other countries, it can lose its market and be ruined. Under reasonably favorable conditions, it may easily be introduced into a country, but for this very reason can easily be destroyed. At the same time, through the mode in which it is carried on, particularly in the 18th century, in the countryside, it is to such an extent interwoven with the vital relationships of a great mass of individuals that no country dare jeopardize its existence by permitting free competition insofar as it manages to export. It therefore depends entirely on the extension or restriction of commerce.
and exercises a relatively very small reaction on the latter, hence its secondary importance in the influence of the merchants in the, in the 18th century. It was the merchants and especially the shippers who more than anybody else pressed for state protection and monopolies. The manufacturers also demanded and indeed received protection, but all the time were inferior in political importance to the merchants. The commercial towns, particularly the maritime towns, became to some extent civilized and acquired the outlook of the big bourgeoisie, but in the factory towns, an extreme petty bourgeois outlook persisted. C. C. F. Aiken, etc. The 18th century was the century of trade. Pinto says this expressly. Le commerce fate le marote du sales and du pause coke temps illness plus question q de commerce de navigation et de marine. Commerce is the rage of the century. For some time now, people have been talking only about commerce, navigation, and the navy. This period is also characterized by the cessation of the bans on the export of gold and silver and the beginning of the trade in money. By banks, national debts, paper money, by speculation in stocks and shares, in stock jobbing in all articles by the development of finance in general. Again, capital lost a great part of the natural character which had still clung to it. 4. Most extensive division of labor, large scale industry. The concentration of trade and manufacture in one country, England, developing irresistibly in the 17th century, gradually created for this country a relative world market, and thus a demand for the manufactured products of this country, which can no longer be met by the industrial productive forces hitherto existing. This demand outgrowing the productive forces was the motive power which, by producing big industry, the application of elemental forces to industrial ends, machinery in the most complex division of labor, called into existence the third period of private ownership since the Middle Ages. There already existed in England and other preconditions of this new phase, freedom of competition inside the nation, the development of theoretical me mechanics, etc. Indeed, the science of mechanics perfected by Newton was altogether the most popular science in France and England in the 18th century. Free competition inside the nation itself had everywhere to be conquered by a revolution, 1640 and 1688 in England, 1789 in France. Competition soon compelled every country that wished to retain its historical role to protect its manufacturers by renewed customs regulations. The old duties were no longer any good against big industry, and soon after, to introduce big industry under protective duties, Big industry universalized competition in spite of these protective measures. It is practical free trade. The protective duty is only a pa palliative, a measure of defense within free trade. Established means of communication in the modern world market subordinated trade to itself, transformed all capital into industrial capital and thus produced the rapid circulation development of the financial system in the centralization of capital. By universal competition, it forced all individuals to strain their energy to the utmost. It destroyed as far as possible ideology, religion, morality, etc., and where it could not do this, made them into a palpable lie. It produced world history for the first time insofar as it made all civilized nations and every individual member of them dependent for the satisfaction of their wants on the whole world, thus destroying the former natural exclusiveness of separate nations. It made natural science 
subservient to capital and took from the division of labor the semblance the the last semblance of its natural character it destroyed natural growth in general as far as this is possible while labor exists and resolved all natural relationships into money relationships in the place of natural naturally grown towns it created the modern large industrial cities which have sprung up overnight wherever it penetrated it destroyed the crafts in all earlier stages of industry it completed the victory of the commercial town over the countryside its first premise was the automatic system its development produced a mass of productive forces for which private property became just as just as much a fetter as the guild had had been for the manufacturer in the small rural workshop for the developing craft these productive forces received under the system of private property a one-sided development only and became for the majority destructive forces moreover a great multitude of such forces of such forces could find no application at all within this system generally speaking big industry created everywhere the same relations between the classes of society and thus destroyed the peculiar in the peculiar individuality of the various nationalities and finally while the bourgeoisie of each nation still re retained separate national interests big industry created a class which in all nations has the same interests and with which nationality is already dead a class which is really rid of all the old world and at the same time stands pitted against it big industry makes for the worker not only the the relation to the capitalist but labor itself unbearable it is evident that big industry does not reach the same level of development in all districts of a country this does not however retard the class movement of the proletariat because the proletarians created by big industry assume leadership of this movement and carry the whole mass along with them and because the workers excluded from big industry are placed by it in a still worse situation than the workers in big industry itself the big countries in which big industry is developed act in a similar manner upon the more or less non-industrial countries insofar as the latter are swept by universal commerce into the universal competitive struggle these different forms are just so many forms of the organization of labor and hence of property in each period a unification of the existing productive forces takes place insofar as this has been rendered necessary by needs the relation of state and law to property the first form of property in the ancient world as in the middle ages is tribal property determined with the romans chiefly by war with the germans by the rearing of cattle in the case of the ancient peoples since several tribes live together in one town the tribal property appears as state property and the right of the individual to it as mere possession which however like tribal property as a whole is confined to landed property gen is confined to landed property only real property real private property began with the ancients as with modern nations with movable property slavery and community dominion ex jure coritum in the case of the nations which grew out of the middle ages tribal property evolved through various stages feudal landed property corporative movable property capital invested in manufacture to modern capital determined by big industry and universal competition i.e pure private property which has cast off all semblance of a communal institution and has shut out the state from any influence on the development of property to this modern private property course to this modern private property corresponds the modern state which purchased gradually by the owners of property by means of taxation has fallen entirely into their hands through the national debt in its existence 
has become wholly dependent on the commercial credit which the owners of property, the bourgeois, extend to it as reflected in the rise and fall of state funds on the stock exchange. By the mere fact that it is a class and no longer in a state, the bourgeoisie is forced to organize itself no longer locally, but nationally, and to give a general form to its mean average interests. Through the emancipation of private property from the community, the state has become a separate entity, beside and outside civil society, but it is nothing more than the form of organization which the bourgeois necessarily adopt both for internal and external purposes, for the mutual guarantee of their property in the, and interests. The independence of the state is only found nowadays in those countries where the estates have not yet completely developed into classes, where the estates done away with in more advanced countries still have a part to play, and where there exists a mixture, countries which, countries, that is to say, in which no one section of the population can achieve dominance over the others. This is the case particularly in Germany. The most perfect example of the modern state is North America. The modern French, English, and American writers all express the opinion that the state exists only for the sake of private property, so that this fact has penetrated into the consciousness of the normal man. Since the state is the form in which the individuals of a ruling class assert their common interests, in which the whole civil society of an epoch is a pen epitomize, it follows that the state mediates in the formation of all common institutions and that the institutions receive a political form. Hence, the illusion that law is based on the will, and indeed on the will divorced from its real basis, on free will. Similarly, justice is in its turn reduced to the actual laws. Civil law develops simultaneously with private property out of the disintegration of the natural community. With the Romans, the development of private property and civil law had no further industrial and commercial consequences because their whole mode of production did not alter usury. With modern peoples, where the feudal community was disintegrated by industry and trade, there began with the rise of private property and, and civil law a new, a new phase which was capable of further development. The very first town, which carried on an extensive maritime trade in the Middle Ages, Amalfi, also developed maritime law. As soon as industry and trade developed, private property further, first in Italy and later in other countries, the highly developed Roman civil law was immediately adopted again and raised to authority. When later, the bourgeoisie had acquired so much power th that the princes took up its interest in order to overthrow the feudal nobility by means of the bourgeoisie, there began in all countries in France in the 16th century the real development of law, which in all countries except England proceeded on the basis of the Roman Codex. In England, too, Roman legal principles had to be introduced to to further the development of civil law, especially in the case of movable property, it must not be forgotten that law has just as little an in independent history as religion. In civil law, the existing property relationships are declared to be the result of the general will, the just utendi et abutendi itself asserts on the one hand the fact that private property has become entirely independent of the community, and on the other, the illusion that private property itself is based solely on the private will, the arbitrary disposal of the thing. In practice, the abuti has very definite economic, limit economic limitations for the owner of private property. If he does not wish to see his property, and hence his just abutendi pass into other hands, since actually the thing, considered merely with reference to his will, is not a thing at all.
but only becomes a thing, true property in intercourse and independently of the law, a relationship which the philosophers call an idea. This judicial illusion, which reduces law to the mere will, necessarily leads in the further development of property relationships to the position that a man may have a legal title to a thing without really having the thing. If, for instance, the income from a piece of land is lost owing to competition, then the proprietor has certainly his legal title to it along with the just utendi et abutendi, but he can do nothing with it. He owns nothing as a landed proprietor if in addition he has not enough capital to cultivate his ground. This illusion of the jurists also explains the fact that for them, as for every code, it is altogether fortuitous that individuals among other relationships among themselves, e.g. contracts, it explains why they consider that these relationships can be entered into or not at, at will, and that their content rests purely on the individual free will of the contracting parties. Whenever, through the development of industry and commerce, new forms of intercourse have been evolved, e.g. assurance companies, etc., the law has, has always been compelled to omit them among the modes of acquiring property. Notes written by Marx, intended for further elaboration. 12. Forms of Social Consciousness the influence of the division of labor on science, the role of repression with regard to the state, law, morality, etc. It is precisely because the bourgeoisie rules as a class that in the law it must give itself a general expression, natural science and history. There is no history of politics, law, science, etc., of art, religion, etc. Marginal note by Marx to the community as it appears in the ancient state, in feudalism and in the absolute monarchy, to this bond correspond especially the religious conceptions. Why the ideologists turn everything upside down? Clerics, jurists, politicians, jurists, politicians, statesmen in general, moralists, clerics. For this ideological subdivision, within a class, one, the occupation assumes an independent existence owing to division of labor. Everyone believes his craft to be the true one. Illusions regarding the connection between their craft and reality are the more likely to be cherished by them because of the very nature of the craft. In consciousness, in Jewish in jurisprudence, politics, etc., relations become concepts since they do not go beyond these relations. The concepts of the relations also become fixed concepts in their mind. The judge, for example, applies the code. He therefore regards legislation as the real, active driving force. Respect for their goods because their craft deals with general matters. Idea of law idea of state. The matter is turned upside down in ordinary consciousness. Religion is from the outset consciousness of the transcendental arising from actually existing forces. This more popularly, tradition with regard to all religion, etc. Individuals always proceeded and always proceed from themselves. Their relations are the relations of their real-life process. How does it happen that their relations assume an independent existence over against them, and that the forces of their own life become superior to them? In short, division of labor, the, the level of which depends on the, on the development of the productive power at any particular time, landed property, communal property, feudal modern, estate property, manufacturing property, industrial capital. D.
proletarians and communism, individuals, class, and community. In the Middle Ages, the citizens in each town were compelled to unite against the landed nobility to save their skins. The extension of, of trade, the establishment of communications, let the separate towns to get to know other towns, which had asserted the same interests in the struggle with the same antagonists. Out of the many local corporations of burghers, there arose only gradually the burger class. The conditions of life of the individual burghers became, on account of their contradiction to the, exi to the existing relationships and of the mode of labor determined by these conditions which were common to them all and independent of each individual. The burghers had created the conditions insofar as they had torn themselves free from feudal ties and were created by them insofar as they were determined by their antagonism to the feudal system which they found in existence. When the, when the individual towns began to enter into associations, these common conditions developed into class, into class conditions. The same conditions, the same contradiction, the same interests necessarily called forth on the whole similar customs everywhere. The bourgeoisie itself, with its conditions, develops only gradually, splits according to the division of labor into various fractions, and finally absorbs all property class, classes it finds in existence. While it develops the majority of the earlier propertyless and a part of the hitherto property classes into a new class, the proletariat, in the measure to which all property found in existence is transformed into industrial or commercial capital. These separate individuals form a class only insofar as they have to carry on a common battle against another class. Otherwise, they are on hostile terms with each other as competitors. On the other hand, the class in its turn achieves an independent existence over over against the individuals, so that the latter find their conditions of existence predestined, and hence have their position in life and their personal development assigned to them by their class, become subsumed under it. This is the same phenomenon as the subjection of the separate individuals to the division of labor and can only be removed by the abolition of private property and of labor itself. We have already indicated several times how this subsuming of individuals under the class brings with it their subjection to all kinds of ideas, etc. If, it, if from a philosophical point of view, one considers this evolution of individuals in the common conditions of existence of estates and classes which followed on one another, and in the accompanying general conceptions forced upon them, it is certainly very easy to imagine that in these individuals the species or man has evolved or that they evolved man and in this way one can give history some hard clouts on the ear one can conceive these various estates and classes to be specific terms of the general expression subordinate varieties of the of the species or evolutionary phases of man this subsuming of individuals under definite classes cannot be abolished until a class has taken shape, which is no longer any particular class interest to assert against the ruling class. The transformation through the division of labor, of personal powers, relationships into material powers cannot be dispelled by dismissing the general idea of it from one's mind, but can only be abolished by the individuals again subjecting these material powers to themselves and abolishing the division of labor. This is not possible without the community. Only in community with others has with others has each individual the means of cultivating his gifts in all directions. Only in the community, therefore, is personal freedom possible. In the previous substitutes for the community, in the state, etc. Personal personal freedom has existed only for the individuals who developed within the relationships of the ruling class, and only insofar as they were individuals of this class. 
the illusory community in which individuals have up till now combined always took on an independent existence in relation to them. It was at the same time, since it was the combination of one class over against another, not only a completely illusory community, but a new fetter as well. In a real community, the individuals obtain their freedom in and through their association. Individuals have always built on themselves, but naturally on themselves within their given historical conditions and relationships, not on the pure individual in the sense of the ideologists, but in the course of historical evolution and precisely through the inevitable fact that within the division of labor, social relationships take on an independent existence, there appears a division within the life of each individual insofar as it is personal and insofar as it is determined by some branch of labor and the conditions pertaining to it. We do not mean it to be understood from this, from this that, for example, the rentier, the capitalist, etc., cease to be persons, but their personality is conditioned and determined by quite definite class relationships, and the division appears only in their opposition to another class and for themselves, only when they go bankrupt. In the estate, and even more in the tribe, this is as yet concealed. For instance, a nobleman always remains a nobleman, a commoner always a commoner. Apart from this other relationships, apart from his other relationships, a quality inseparable from his individuality. The division between the personal and the class individual the accidental nature of the conditions of life for the individual appears only with the emergence of the class, which is itself a product of the bourgeoisie. This accidental character is only engendered and developed by competition in the struggle of individuals among themselves. Thus, in imagination, individuals seem freer under the dominance of the bourgeoisie than before, because their conditions of life seem accidental. In reality, of course, they are less free, because they are more subjected to the violence of things. The difference from the estate comes out particularly in the antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. When the estate of the urban burghers, the corporations, etc., emerged in opposition to the landed nobility, their condition of existence, movable property, and craft labor which had already existed latently before their separation from the feudal ties, appeared as something positive, which was asserted against feudal landed property, and therefore, in its own way, at first took on a feudal form. Certainly, the refugee serfs treated their previous servitude as something accidental to their personality, but here they only were doing that we're doing what every class that is freeing itself from a fetter does. And they did not free themselves as a class, but separately. Moreover, they did not rise above the system of estates, but only formed a new estate, retaining their previous mode of labor even in their new situation, and developing it further by freeing it from its earlier fetters, which no longer corresponded to the development already attained. For the proletarians, on the other hand, the condition of their existence, labor, and with it all the conditions of existence governing modern society, have become something accidental, something over which they, as separate individuals, have no control, and over which no social organization can give them control. The contradiction between the individuality of each separate proletarian and labor, the condition of life forced upon him becomes evident to him himself, for he is sacrificed from youth upwards, and within his own class has no chance of arriving at the conditions which would place him in the other class. Thus, while the refugee serfs only wish to be free to develop and assert those conditions of existence which were already there, and hence, in the end, only arrived at free labor, the proletarians, if they are to assert themselves as individuals, will have to abolish the very condition of their existence hitherto, which has, moreover, 
than that of all society up to the present, namely labor. Thus, they find themselves directly opposed to the form in which, hitherto, the individuals of which society consists have given themselves collective expression, that is, the state. In order, therefore, to assert themselves as individuals, they must overthrow the state. It follows from all we have been saying up till now that the communal relationship into which the individuals of a class entered and which was determined by their common interests over against a third party was always a community to which these individuals belonged only as average individuals, only insofar as they lived within the conditions of existence of their class, a relationship in which they participated not as individuals, but as members of a class, with the community of revolutionary proletarians, on the other hand, who take their conditions of existence in those of all members of society under their control. It is just the reverse. It is as individuals that the individuals participate in it. It is just this combination of individuals, assuming the advanced stage of modern productive forces, of course, which puts the conditions of the free development and movement of individuals under the under their control conditions which were previously abandoned to chance and had won in independent existence over against these separate individuals just because of their sep separation as individuals and because of the necessity of their combination which had been determined by the division of labor and through their separation had become a bond alien to them combination up till now by no means an arbitrary one such as is expounded for example in the contract in the contract social but a necessary one was an agreement within these conditions within which the individuals were free to enjoy the freaks of fortune compare e.g. the formation of the north american state in the south american republics this right to the undisturbed enjoyment within certain conditions of fortuity and chance has up till now been called personal freedom. These conditions of existence are, of course, only the productive forces and forms of intercourse at any particular time. Forms of intercourse. Communism differs from all previous movements in that it overturns the basis of all earlier relations of production and intercourse, and for the first time consciously treats all natural premises as the creatures of hitherto existing men, trips them, strips them of their natural character and subjugates them to the power of the united individuals. Its organization is, therefore, essentially economic, the material production of the conditions of this unity. It turns existing conditions into conditions of unity. The reality which communism is creating is precisely the true basis for rendering it impossible that anything should exist independently of individuals, insofar as reality is only a product of the preceding intercourse of individuals themselves. Thus, the communists in practice treat the conditions created up to now by production and intercourse as inorganic conditions, without, however, imagining that it was the plan for the destiny of previous generations to give them material and without believing that these conditions were inorganic for the individuals creating them. Contradiction between individuals and their conditions of life, as contradiction between productive forces in the form of intercourse, the difference between the individual as a person and what is accidental to him, is not a conceptual difference but an, his but an historical fact. This distinction has a different significance at different times e.g. the estate as something accidental to the individual in the 18th century, the family more or less too. It is not a distinction that we have to make for each age, but one which each age makes itself from among the different elements, which it finds in existence, indeed and indeed not, not according to any theory, but compelled by material collisions and life. What appears accidental to the later age as opposed to the earlier, and this applies also to the elements handed down by an earlier age, is a form of intercourse which corresponded to a definite stage of development 
of the productive forces. The relation of the productive forces to the form of intercourse is the relation of the form of intercourse to the occupation or activity of the individuals. The fundamental form of this activity is, of course, material, on which depend all other forms, mental, political, religious, etc. The various shaping of material life is, of course, in every case, dependent on the needs which are already developed in the production as well as the satisfaction of these needs is an historical process which is not found in the case of a sheep or a dog. Stirner's refractory principle argument adverses, hom adverses hominem. Although sheep and dogs in their present form certainly but malgri ukes are products of an, histor of an historical process, the conditions under which individuals have intercourse with each other, so long as the above-mentioned contradiction is absent, are conditions appertaining to their individuality, in no way external to them, conditions under which these definite individuals living under definite relationships can alone produce their material life, and what is connected with it are thus the conditions of their self-activity and are produced by this self-activity. The definite condition under which they produce thus corresponds as long as the contradiction has not yet appeared to the reality of their conditioned nature, their one-sided existence and the one-sidedness of which only becomes evident when the contradiction enters on the scene and thus exists for the, la for the later individuals then this condition appears as an accidental fetter, and the consciousness that that it is a fetter is, in, in, is impeted to the earlier age as well. These various conditions, which appear first as conditions of self-activity, later as fetters upon it, form in the whole evolution of history a coherent series of forms of intercourse, the coherence of which consists in this. In the place of an earlier form of intercourse, which has become a fetter, a new one is put, corresponding to the more developed productive forces and hence to the advanced mode of the self-activity of individuals, a form which in its turn becomes a fetter and is then replaced by another. Since these conditions correspond at every stage to the simultaneous development of the productive forces, their history is at the same time the history of the evolving productive forces taken over by each new generation, and is therefore the history of the development of the forces of the individuals themselves. Since this evolution takes place naturally, i.e. is not subordinated to a general plan of freely combined individuals, it proceeds from various localities, tribes, nations, branches of labor, etc., each of which each of which to start with develops independently of the others and only gradually enters into relation with the others. Furthermore, it takes place only very slowly. The various stages and interests are never completely overcome, but only subordinated to the prevailing interests and trail along beside the, the, the latter for centuries afterwards. It follows from this that within a nation itself, the, the individuals, even a even apart from their pecuniary circumstances, have quite different developments, and that in earlier interests, the peculiar form of intercourse of which has already been ousted by that belonging to a later interest remains for a long time afterwards in possession of a traditional power in the illusory community, state law, which has one in existence independent of the individuals, a power which in the last resort can only be broken by a revolution. This explains why, with reference to individual points, which allow of a more general summing up, consciousness can sometimes appear further advanced than the contemporary empirical relationships, so that in the struggles of a later epoch one can refer to earlier theoreticians as authorities. On the other hand, in countries which, like North America, begin in an already advanced historical epoch, the development proceeds very rapidly.
such countries have no other natural premises than the individuals who settled there and were led to do so because the forms of intercourse of the old countries did not correspond to their wants. Thus, they begin with the most advanced individuals of the old countries, and therefore with the correspondingly most advanced form of intercourse before this form of intercourse has been able to establish itself in the old countries. This is the case with all colonies. Insofar as they are not mere military or trading stations, Carthage, the Greek colonies, and Iceland in the 11th and 12th centuries provide examples of this. A similar relationship issues from conquest form a, a form of intercourse which has evolved on another soil is brought over complete to the conquered country, whereas in its home it was still encumbered with interests and relationships left over from earlier periods. Here it can and must be established completely and without hindrance, if only to assure the conqueror's lasting power. England and Naples, after the Norman conquest, when they received the most perfect form of feudal organization. 5. The contradiction between the productive forces and the form of intercourse as the basis for social revolution. This contradiction between the productive forces and the form of intercourse, which as we saw, has occurred several times in past history, without, however, endangering the basis necessarily on each occasion bursts out in a revolution, taking on at the same time various subsidiary forms, such as all embracing collisions, collisions of various clashes of cla collisions of various classes, contradiction of consciousness, battle of ideas, etc., political conflict, etc. From a narrow point of view, one may isolate one of these subsidiary forms and consider it as the basis of these revolutions, and this is all the more easy as the individuals who started the revolutions had illusions about their own activity according to their degree of culture in the stage of historical development. Thus all collisions in the in thus all collisions in history have their origin, according to our view, in the contradiction between the productive forces and the form of intercourse. Incidentally, to lead to collisions in a country, this contradiction need not necessarily have reached its extreme limit in this particular country. The competition with industrially more advanced countries brought about by the expansion of international intercourse is sufficient to produce a similar contradiction in countries with a backward industry e.g. the latent proletariat in Germany brought into view by view by the competition of English industry. The conquest, conquest, this whole interpretation of history appears to be contradicted by the fact of conquest. Up till now, violence, war, pillage, murder, and robbery, etc., have been accepted as the driving force of history. Here we must limit ourselves to the chief points and take, therefore, only the most striking example, the destruction of an old civilization by a barbarous people and the resulting formation of an entirely new organization of society, Rome and the barbarians, feudalism in Gaul, the Byzantine Empire, and the Turks. With the conquering barbarian people War itself is still, as indicated above, a regular form of intercourse, which is the more eagerly exploited as the, in as the increase in population together with the traditional and, for it, the only possible crude mode of production gives rise to the need for new means of production. In Italy, on the other hand, the concentration of landed property caused not only by buying up and indebtedness but also by inheritance, since loose living being rife in marriage rare, the old families gradually died out, and their possessions fell into the hands of a few. And its conversion into grazing land caused not only 
by the usual economic forces still operative today, but by the importation of plundered and tribute corn and the resultant lack of demand for Italian corn brought about the almost total disappearance of the free population. The very slaves died out again and again and had constantly to be replaced by new ones. Slavery remained the basis of the whole productive system. The plebeians, midway between freemen and slaves, never succeeded in becoming more than a proletarian rabble. Rome indeed never became more than a city. Its connection with the provinces was almost exclusively political and could therefore easily be broken again by political events. Nothing is more common than the notion that in history up till now, it has only been a question of taking. The barbarians take the Roman Empire, and this fact of taking is made to explain the transition from old world from the old world to the feudal system. In this taking by barbarians, however, the question is whether the nation which is conquered has evolved industrial productive forces as is the case with modern peoples, or whether their productive forces are based for the most part merely on, the, on their association and on the community. Taking is further determined by the object taken. A banker's fortune consisting of paper cannot be taken at all without the takers submitting to the conditions of production and intercourse of the country taken. Similarly, the total industrial capital of a modern industrial country. And finally, everywhere there is very soon an end to taking, and when there is nothing more to take, you have to set about producing. From this necessity of producing, which very soon asserts itself, it follows that the form of, commu of community adopted by the, by the settling conquerors must correspond to the stage of development of the productive forces they find in existence. Or, if this is not the case from the start, it must change according to the productive forces. By this, too, is explained the fact which people profess to have noticed everywhere in the period following the migration of that people of the peoples, namely, that the servant was master and that the conquerors very soon took over language, culture, and manners from the conquered. The feudal system was by no means brought complete from Germany, but had its origin as far as the conquerors were concerned in the in the martial organization of the army during the actual conquest, and this only evolved after the conquest into the feudal system proper to the action of the productive forces found in the conquered countries. To what an extent this form was determined by the productive forces is shown by the abortive attempts to realize their forms derived from reminiscences of ancient Rome, Charlemagne, etc., contradictions of big industry revolution our in investigation our investigation hitherto started from the instruments of production and it has already shown that private property was a necessity for certain industrial stages in industry extractive private property still coincides with labor in small industry in in all agriculture up till now Property is the necessary consequence of the existing instruments of production. In big industry, the contradiction between the instrument of production and private property appears from the first time and is the product and is the product of big industry. Moreover, big industry must be highly developed to produce this contradiction. And thus only with big industry does the, abol does the abolition of private property become possible. 9. Contradiction between the productive forces in the form of intercourse. In big industry and in competition, the whole mass of conditions of existence, limitations, biases of individuals are fused together into the two simplest forms, private property and labor. With money, every form of intercourse and intercourse itself is considered fortuitous for the individuals. Thus, money implies that all previous intercourse was only intercourse 
of individuals under particular conditions, not of not of individuals as individuals. These conditions are are reduced to two: accumulated labor or private property, and actual labor. If both or one of these ceases, then intercourse comes to a standstill. The modern economists themselves, e.g., Sismondi, Cherbuliz, etc., oppose association of individuals to association of capital. On the other hand, the individuals themselves are entirely subordinated to the division of labor, and hence are brought into the most complete dependence on one another. Private property, insofar as within labor itself, it is opposed to labor, evolves out of the out of the necessity of accumulation. It has still, to begin with, rather the form of the community, but in its further development, it approaches more and more the modern form of private property. The division of labor implies, from the outset, the division of the conditions of, of labor, of tools and materials, and thus the splitting up of accumulated capital among different owners, and thus, also, the division between capital and labor in the different forms of property itself. The more the division of labor develops and accumulation grows, the sharper are the forms that this process of differentiation assumes. Labor itself can only exist on the premise of this fragmentation. Thus, two facts are here re revealed. First, the productive forces appear as a world for themselves, quite independent of and divorced from the individuals alongside the individuals. The reason for this is that the individuals whose forces they are exist split up and in opposition to one another. Whilst on the other hand, these forces are only real forces in the intercourse and associations of these individuals. Thus, on the one hand, we have a totality of productive forces which have, as it were, taken on a material form and are for the individuals no longer the forces of the individuals but of private property, and hence of the individuals only insofar as they are owners of private property themselves. Never, in any earlier period, have the productive forces taken on a form so, in so indifferent to the intercourse of individuals as individuals because their intercourse itself was formerly a restricted one. On the other hand, standing over against these productive forces, we have the majority of the individuals from whom these forces have been wrested away, and who, robbed thus of all real life content, have become abstract individuals, but who are, however, only, but, only by this fact put into a position to enter into a relation with one another as individuals. The only connection which still links them with the productive forces and with their own existence, labor, has lost all semblance of self-activity and only sustains their life by stunting it. While in the earlier periods, self-activity and the production of material life were separated in that they devolved on different persons and while on account of the narrowness of the individuals themselves, the production of material life was considered as a subordinate mode of self-activity. They now diverge to such an extent that altogether material life appears as the end. And what produces this material life, labor, which is now the only possible but, as we see, negative form of self-activity as the means. 10. The necessity of preconditions and consequences of the abolition of private property. Thus, things have now come to such a pass that the individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces, not only to achieve self-activity, but also merely to safeguard their own existence. This appropriation is first determined by the object to be appropriated. The productive forces which have been developed to a totality and which only exists within a universal intercourse. From this aspect alone, therefore, this appropriation must have a universal character corresponding to the productive forces in the intercourse. The appropriation of these forces is itself nothing more than the development 
of the individual capacities corresponding to the material instruments of production. The appropriation of a totality of instruments of production is, for this very reason, the development of a totality of capacities in the individuals themselves. This appropriation is further determined by the persons appropriating. Only the proletarians of the present day, who are completely shut off from all self-activity, are, are in a position to achieve a complete and no longer restricted self-activity, which consists in the appropriation of a totality of productive forces and in the in, in the thus postulated development of a totality of capacities, all earlier revolutionary appropriations were restricted. Individuals whose self-activity was restricted by a crude instrument of production in a limited intercourse appropriated this crude instrument of production and hence merely achieved a new state of limitation. Their instrument of production became their property, but they themselves remained subordinate to the division of labor and their own instrument of production. In all expropriations up to now, a mass of individuals remain subservient to a single instrument of production. In the appropriation by the proletarians, a mass of instruments of production must be made subject to each individual and property to all. Modern universal intercourse can be controlled by individuals, therefore only when controlled by all. This appropriation is further determined by the manner in which it must be effected. It can only be effected through a union, which by the character of the proletariat itself can again only be a universal one, and through a revolution in which, on the one hand, the power of the earlier mode of production and intercourse and social organization is overthrown, and on the other hand, on, on the other hand, there develops the universal character and the energy of the proletariat without, without which the revolution cannot be accomplished, and in which, further, the proletariat rids itself of everything that still clings to it from its previous position in society. Only at this stage does self-activity coincide with material life which corresponds to the to the development of individuals into complete individuals in the casting off of all natural limitations the transformation of labor into self-activity corresponds to the transformation of the earlier limited intercourse into the intercourse of individuals as such with the appropriation of the total productive forces through united individuals private property comes to an end most previously in history, a particular condition always appeared as accidental. Now the isolation of individuals in the particular private gain of each man have themselves become accidental. The individuals who are no longer subject to the division of labor have been conceived by the philosophers as an ideal under the name man. They have conceived the whole process process which we have outlined as the evolutionary process of man so that at each historical stage man was substituted for the individuals and shown as the motive force of history the whole process was thus conceived as a process of the self estrangement of man and this was essentially due to the fact that the average individual of the later stage was always foisted onto the earlier stage in the consciousness of a later age onto the individuals of an earlier. Through this inversion, which from the first is an abstract image of the actual conditions, it was possible to transform the whole of history into an evolutionary process of consciousness. The necessity of the communist revolution finally from the necessity of the communist revolution. Finally, from the con com from the conception of history, we have sketched. We have sketched. We obtain these further conclusions. One, in the development of productive forces, there comes a stage when productive forces and means of intercourse are brought into being.
which under the existing relationships only cause mischief and are no longer productive but destructive forces, machinery, and money. And connected with this, a class is called forth, which has to bear all the burdens of society with, without enjoying its advantages, which ousted from society is forced into the most decided antagonism to all other classes, a class which forms the majority of all members of society, and from each emanates the consciousness of the necessity of a fundamental revolution. The communist consciousness, which may, of course, arise among the other classes too, through the contemplation of the situation of this class. Two, the conditions under which definite productive forces can be applied are the conditions of the rule of a definite class of society, whose social power, deriving from its property, has its practical idealistic expression in each case in the form of the state, and therefore every revolutionary struggle is directed against a class which till then has been in power. 3. In all revolutions up till now, the mode of activity always remained unscathed, and it was only a question of a different distribution of this activity, a new distribution of labor to other persons, whilst the communist revolution is directed against the preceding mode of, act of activity, does away with labor, and abolishes the rule of all classes with the classes themselves, because it is carried through by the class which no longer counts as a class in society, is not recognized as a class. It is in itself the expression of the dissolution of all classes, nationalities, etc., within present society, and for both for the production and on a mass scale of this communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary, an alteration which can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. Thank you everyone for watching and listening.